Well, that's what's important about the second coming. All those things uh, have to do with the fact I'm coming soon. Uh, the kind of thing that uh, maybe, maybe we won't get through with the sermon sort of a thing. When Jesus said, I'm coming soon and it's sooner rather than later, I suspect we really ought to believe him. Amen. First point on your list there will be about promises. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. That applies both ways. It applies to us, but it applies to God, too. How do we know God? Well, sometimes in the act of worshiping Him or in serving Him, but sometimes we know God by what He does, much as He knows us by what we do. Consider then the promises of God. I know, I know most of you know these, but let's just mention two or three for your thinking tonight. In, in, with respect to Adam and Eve in Genesis 2, God said to Adam, Eve hadn't come along yet, in 2.17, he says, you can eat of every tree except that when the day you do, you will die. Well, Eve found out about it because her husband told her, chapter 3, she repeats it. I do not know, I often wondered, did Adam and Eve believe God? Or did she just repeat what she heard? Now, sometimes it's the one and sometimes it's the other. But pretty soon, they found out that God keeps his word because Genesis 3 says that he excluded them from the garden and the tree of life. And 5.5 5 says Adam lived 930 years and he died, just like God said he would. But he died the day he was excluded from that garden. I've often wondered how old he was at that time. Was he 200 or I don't know how old he was. When did he start counting time? Genesis 1, the son, I don't know. But I want you to think about God's promises. God was right. Adam uh, should have believed him. How about the promise to Noah? Noah comes along into biblical history, and the flood comes, and Genesis 8 says that Noah built an altar to God after the flood was all over, and God says to him in chapter 8 and verse 22, he said, I have a covenant with you and with all, all of us. Put down here, he said, as long as the earth remains, and that may not be forever, as long as the earth remains, he said, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Has he kept his word? Yes, he's kept his word right up to this moment. Uh, El Nino notwithstanding, he has kept his word. Amen. How about Abraham and Isaac, the familiar one in Genesis 12 and verse 3? Through you, God says to Ab Abraham, all, as Abraham at that time, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And he was right. But I want you to think about a promise that God made. In a little different tack, but with respect to Moses' next big figure down the line, maybe. At least he's a, he's a transitional figure anyway. When God chose Moses to go back to Israel, or go back to Egypt and to Israel down in Egypt, God says to Moses, he said, you go tell those people down there that I'm going to set them free. And he said, I want you to tell them this. In Exodus 3 and verse 21, you will not leave Egypt empty-handed. You will not leave empty-handed. He said, you are going to plunder the Egyptians. God made a promise. Chapter 12 and verse 36, the people of Israel did exactly what God said. They asked the people in their home and their neighbors for gold and silver and clothes, those three items. And the text says the Egyptians gave it to them. And they plundered the Egyptians, just like God said they would. So imagine all the boys and girls leaving with gold watches and fine rings, and I don't know what all they had, but it was gold and silver and fine clothes, I know that. And I sometimes thought, what a travesty that probably most of that gold went into a calf and Moses chewed it up, ground it up, threw it in a branch or some kind of a stream and made the Israelites drink of it. Well, that's what you call a belly full of idolatry, but I'm just thinking how they got that. They didn't have it to start with, but God kept a promise anyway. How about a Messiah? In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, Micah was told to tell Israel that Bethlehem, a little bitty town now in the south part, small among the clans, God says, out of you, out of you, God says, shall come for me, God speaking, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, and even from ancient times, some versions have it, from, from uh, day one or something like that. Summary, God promised we know him by his fruits. And he kept those words. In many and various ways, God promised, and he kept his word. 
There's a text in 1 Peter 1 that's familiar to most of you, and it reads like this. The prophets, Peter said, about the salvation that God had talked about and that he had talked about in Christ, he said, that salvation, he said, the prophets, the prophets, he said, searched intently and with the greatest care. They read every jot and tittle, I suspect, with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances which, he said, to which the Spirit of God in them was pointing. I wonder sometimes when Micah said that, and ultimately I suppose wrote it, if though he was up in the north, if he didn't go down to Bethlehem and see where this might take place. Maybe Peter's writing about fellows like Micah, who really wanted to know, could I move down to Bethlehem and see the Messiah? Would that have been, you think, an impossibility for Micah to have thought, maybe in my lifetime it will come. Now all of us know the little verse in Peter that says, God's days are not ours, thousand years in that, that text, so just call that to mind. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. God made a promise. In the day you do, you will die. As I said, I do not know how old Adam was, our time, when he was excluded from the garden. Maybe it was 930 years after the exclusion that he died. I don't know when we start counting time here. But I want you to think about at least a measurable interlude between the time of the promise and the effect of the promise. Might be an important point. Between the time of the promise and the effect of the promise. When did it take effect? Here's the word. When does it happen? Might be a point. With respect to Abraham, in you, God said, all the nations of this earth will be blessed. Paul tells us that after that promise, 430 years later, the law came. But after the law came, how many years went by? 1,400 and some. It was actually almost 1,900 years, give or take a few, between the time of the promise and the time of the fulfillment. That might be important to remember. What God said and when it took place. An interlude, if you will. In Israel's case, in chapter 3 of Exodus, again in verse 7, God said, I have seen the misery of my people Israel. I have heard their cries about the slave drivers. And he said, I, I'm interested, we might say it that way, I am concerned about their status. How long have they been crying out, do you think? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but between the time of the promise and the time of the keeping of the promise, there was some time lapse there. There's an interlude, maybe not 1900 years, but there is some time lapse. And to the extent that he, they inherited what God promised, it was 40 years at least before they got to go into the promised land. They disobeyed God, that was the wrong thing to do. But I, I want to think with you, God made a promise. But there's, some, there's a time frame there that might be important to remember. In Micah's day, that little town, Bethlehem, called Ephraton in the Old Testament, the Old, well, Old Testament, but Genesis, for instance, it was the town near where Rachel had Benjamin and died, that sort of thing. How many years went by between Micah's prophecy and the fulfillment there of 0700 approximately? Time frame lapse. We, we have a promise, and we have fulfillment of the promise. But... There was a time, there's an interlude there. And so, like Aaron mentioned this morning in a rather good sermon, I thought, uh, there were people, though, who kept faith with God. And he mentioned them all, Simeon and Anna and Joseph of Arimathea, all of whom believed God. Amen. Can we mimic the faith of those three people and a lot of others besides? God delivered through Mary a promise. And Jesus was born, and so the words we read in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, Today there is born to you in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and God kept his word. And the shepherds go to see. Jesus remarked about himself, he said, No one, to Nicodemus, said, No one, he said, has ever gone into heaven except he who came from heaven, the Son of Man. That's, that's who he was. He remarked to the disciples in John 16 and verse 20, he said, I came from the Father and entered the world. He said, I'm leaving the world, going back to the Father. God kept his promise. Jesus knew where he was, who he was, from whence he had come. 
And someone as well mentioned, two or three fellows have mentioned the text in Matthew 24. Jesus said, many are going to come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. Pay no attention to them. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Amen. God keeps his promises. But one of the things we ought to, ought to think about here, let's not confuse the present with the promise. That, that's sometimes a mistake we make. Uh, thinking that the promise is now, well, it, the word may be now. But now in whose time? The promise is not necessarily equal to the present. When Jesus said, I shall return, I believe what he said. But there may be an interlude. Next little thought, point two on your outline. Who's coming? Who's the person coming? I, I want you to think that oftentimes who's coming makes a big difference. You know the old song, if I'd have known you was coming, I'd have baked a cake. And you were important enough, I would have done that for you. If I'd have known you were coming. And that sort of thing. All of us are glad. I visited with some friends on trips like this, did this time, and you, you folk do when you go traveling. And maybe they know we're coming, maybe they don't. But if they like us, even if they don't know, they're always glad to see us. Oh, hi, come on in, that sort of a thing. We have people go through granola, as some of these fellows over here know. It, you have to go to granola. It doesn't just happen. You have to go there. But we're always glad to see people, people that we have known. Who's coming is a good question to ask. Well, clearly the one who promised is coming, but who is that? Oh, it's the one that I believe, at least, was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem to a lady named Mary. That wasn't prophesied, but the virgin in the city were. I believe the one's coming is the one who's called out of Egypt. God called his son. I think that's the one who's coming. I think the one coming is the one of whom Nicodemus said, your teacher come from God, because no one can do what you do except God be with him. Well, Nicodemus, you're right. I, I think that's the one who's coming. I think the one's coming, the disciples said, who's this man? That even the winds and the waves obey him. And they responded to some extent adversely. I don't know if they're scared spitless or not, but they sure thought they were in somebody's company they hadn't thought about before. Jesus said of himself, I am the one to whom John bore witness. I am the one of whom Moses wrote about. Uh, in the scriptures you will find me. Uh, it is they who testify of me. He said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. And he was right. And he said, but they testify of me. It's, it's of whom they testified that the important point was made here. Amen. Testified about him. I think the ones coming... Uh, that, that uh, maybe we could characterize it this way, of whom God said, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. You hear him. You hear him, Matthew 17, if you like. I think the one coming is the one of whom the Roman centurion said, why can't he say, truly, this was the son of God? Why can't he say that? I've never figured out all the other texts, some of you Greek students know this, all the other texts that have that particular arrangement always translate thee. Why does he have to say a son? I don't know why. It's because of unbelief of translators, I do too. Uh, I don't know why a Roman can't say this is the Son of God. Why can't he say that? Others said it. Is, is it impossible for Romans to believe? No, I don't think so. Well, that's the Son I think is coming. But let's, let's suggest a couple of things here. One of them is this text out of 2 Thessalonians 3 that sometimes comes to mind. Paul said, brethren, pray for us. He said that we may be delivered from evil and wicked men because, he said, what's, what did he say? All men do not have faith. That's why you pray, because all men, he said, do not have faith. Well, it hasn't changed very much since the days of Paul. <clears throat> Let me suggest some for you tonight. I know that some of you are not so well acquainted with this uh, in the sense of names. But you're going to get the results of it just the same. Some of you have heard about it, some of you haven't, some of you will when I mention it. Now, I'm not trying to insult you, I'm just commenting here that maybe not all of you are interested in the same things I'm interested in, in the way that I'm interested, but you're going to hear about it just the same, and I'll tell you why pretty soon. But how about the Jesus Seminar headed by a fellow named Robert Funk? Or how about the good bishop up in Newark, New Jersey, by the name of John Shelby Spall? Have you heard either one of those fellows, any of those people? Well, maybe or maybe not. But I want to think a little bit with you tonight about those people and the people that they represent. The, the Jesus Seminar people and Funk, uh, uh, with Funk at the head of it, and 
and uh, Spong will in effect say Jesus did not come, he did not go, he is not coming. They have recently published two books, the last one just, uh, the th What Did Jesus Do? Uh, just copyright 1998, just bought it the other day, well, a month ago now, it's okay. And uh, the one about what did he say, entitled The Five Gospels, uh, was published a couple of years back. I bought both of them because I'm interested in that sort of thing. But the effect of what those fellows say and teach and preach is this, that out of all the things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that it is said that Jesus did. Now, if you just read your Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they say only 16% of all that is in there did he do. That's one-sixth of all the things that it is said that he did. Of all the things that he said, they'll agree to 18%. Now that might not make very much sense to you, so I, I, one of the reasons I bought these books, I, it had, they have good introductions to them, and you read the introduction, see what the guys think. You know, the, what, where you start determines where you end, okay? So you read the introductions, about 35 pages, and here's where it goes, but they cover to the books, you know about red letter Bibles, they cover to the books in red and pink and kind of a bluish gray and black. Red, what Jesus said, pink, what it kind of sounds like, Blue, well, maybe, uh, maybe, probably not, but maybe, and black, not a thing. Well, when you thumb through those books, that begins to make an impression. There is no red. There's only one red verse in all of John's gospel. It's John chapter 4 and verse 44 where Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. It's the only thing he said on all of John's gospel. The rest of it is not even in pink. I mean, it's down to blue and black. That makes an impression. I took those books to Sunday school class this past Sunday morning, the class I happened to be teaching. I, I just passed them around. I said, here, folk. i I'd been talking about it so they knew what I was talking about. I said, just thumb through there. You should have seen their faces. I mean, it's one thing to have a guy tell you about them. It's another thing to look and see for yourself, you know, Missouri sort of thing. I want you to think like this, that none of the texts that we've used in this meeting from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with a sole exception, which is in pink, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, did Jesus say, according to these fellows, not even one. So all the texts that have been quoted, they would not have quoted because Jesus didn't say them. They were put into his mouth by uh, writers a hundred years after his day and time. According to them, Jesus was an itinerant, it means wandering around, sage, smart guy, who was laconic, who was non-combative, that is, didn't approach anybody, didn't challenge anybody, didn't care about anybody, didn't heal anybody, didn't walk on water. He was crucified in Jerusalem as a common criminal and buried in a common, unmarked grave, and that's why they couldn't find him. I know you don't believe that, but a lot of people, some of them may be dear to you, have been hearing that. That's what they've been hearing in pews just like you're sitting in. Spong, you know, is the bishop of the diocese, Episcopalian Diocese of New Jersey. That's no small position. A lot of people listen to him. Spong said, heaven, what is it? Where is it? He remarks Paul's faith about heaven and the second coming is as foolish as is ours. He says about the four Gospels, but let it be clearly stated, the Gospels are not in any literal sense holy. They are not accurate and they are not to be confused with reality. That's his latest book, copyrighted this year, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. Same source. Speaking about God, he said, yes, he said, God is real, intensely real for me. But God is not a being external, supernatural, or theistic, to whom I seek access. God is rather a presence discovered in the very depths of my life, in the capacity to live, to ability to love, and the courage to be. You recognize Tillich, some of you fellows there. Well, you say, W.W., why do you worry about Bishop Spong and or the Jesus Seminar? Well, the reason is Spong has written 15 books. One of the books was 
Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalists, published about 1991, it was a bestseller for years. It is still his best-selling book, sold in the millions. I have a copy. Uh, you ask about Spong. Well, have you ever been pictured, <clears throat> for instance, on the front of Time and or Newsweek? No, he has. Have you ever been written up in USA Today? No, he has. Have you ever been on TV talk shows because of his position? No, but he has. Have you ever taken a tour to Australia or, or Canada or Europe on behalf of your views? No, but he has. People know him. Whether they agree with him or not is almost irrelevant, but they know him, and a lot of people are listening and preaching that same thing. The Jesus Seminar people are professors like I used to be and some other guys here are, and some of you maybe are, or at least know about anyway, and that filters down after a while. I'll guarantee you that comes down. It's a little bit like a lot of other things. When the professor teaches it, the students hear, even if they're asleep. And they write it down in their notes. And ten years later, they read it. Well, now, if brother, mm, whatever, that surely must be so. I, I, want, I want you to think along these lines. Peter says, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, he said, but he said in those days, back past, he said, there were also false prophets among the people. Just, he said, as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many, he said, will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Jude verse 3 has the same idea. In his latest book that I mentioned a moment ago, Why Christianity Must Die, <clears throat> Spong uses the old Apostles' Creed. Some of you probably grew up in groups and, or, and you memorized it or is in your hymnal or something like that. It reads like this. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried. He descended into hell. And some ver that's an old version, but anyway. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, that's the old use of the word Catholic, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And Spong spends two whole chapters saying, I don't believe a word of that. I just got the little clip up here, but uh, go to your library and pick it up. He said, for instance, about the word God, he said, the God I know is not concrete or specific, can never be enclosed in propositional statements such as God is love, God is good, God sent Jesus, those are propositional statements. If the God I worship must be identified with these ancient creedal words in any literal sense, he said, God would become for me not just unbelievable, but in fact no longer worthy of being the subject of my devotion. From his book, Resurrection, Myth or Reality, God is not a heavenly man, an external force, or a judging parent. And he means those in, in the bigger senses of the term. God is the creating spirit that calls order out of chaos. God is the life force that emerges first into consciousness, then into self-conscientiousness, and now into self-transcendence, and ultimately into we know not what. Some of you know uh, Whitehead's process theology. God is always changing. He's never the same. The text, for instance, two or three of them, but the one you all know, I, Jehovah, change not, is false. That is not so. Now, I, I know that, I know that uh, you folk out here, sitting out here, don't believe that, but many people do believe it. Many people have been hearing it. What do you do with it? That is, if you heard it, if I got up here and said, uh, I believe that thing, uh, other than the fact you might tar and feather me and get me out of the building, what would you do with it? If you're a parent sitting out there and your children heard me, what would you tell them? When the Bible says we must be ready to give an answer to those who ask, a reason of the hope that is in it, yet do it with meekness and fear, it might be talking about something like that. How do you answer that? Let me give you a summary. Between the Jesus Seminar people and Mr. Spong, here, here are ten things of interest. For instance, they say Jesus of Nazareth was born during the reign of Herod the Great, agree to that. His mother's name was Mary, but he had a human father whose name may not have been Joseph. Jesus was born in Nazareth, not in Bethlehem. Jesus was an itinerant sage who shared meals with social outcasts. Five, Jesus promised he practiced healing without the use of ancient medicine or magic, relieving the afflictions we now consider psychosomatic. Six, 
He did not walk on water, feed the multitude with loaves or fishes, change water into wine or raise Lazarus from the dead. Seven, Jesus was arrested in Jerusalem, crucified by the Romans, executed as a public nuisance. Eight, not proclaiming to be the Son of God. Nine, the empty tomb is a fiction. Jesus did not rise bodily from the dead. And ten, belief in the resurrection is on the visionary experiences of Mary and Peter and Paul. Jesus Seminar people, and I'm not sure, but there's a name on there quite familiar, <clears throat> named, uh, I'll think the kid's name here in a minute, I think he went to Ozark and was one of my Greek students some years back, and some of the Wilbur and Seth are sitting over here and probably was in there, Ron Cameron by name. Uh, he's at Wellesley College, a beast up here somewhere. He's one of the main honchos in the Jesus Seminar thing, if it's the Ron that I know. He has surely moved a long ways. He's come a long ways, baby, since I knew him at last. But one of the things that we, we need to learn from these guys, I mean, you know, failures, you learn from failures in more ways than one. One of the things we need to learn from these fellows is to be careful about resting in the assured results of scholarship. Those are quotes. Just be careful about it. I was an educator quite a good long time, still feel a little bit that way, and some of you have been and are. But let's not bow down to the idol of the assured results of scholarship. Amen. By, by Spong's own testimony, he said, I started with a fellow named Reimers. You don't know that, but that's okay. Went to a fellow named David Strauss in 1835, uh, the life of Jesus thing. He went from Strauss to Rudolf Boltman. He went from Boltman to Whitehead and from Whitehead to Paul Tillich, who was his mentor. And that's when you go down that road, you wind up where he wound up. Amen. That's what you do. Over in Granola, where I live, is a country town. <clears throat> I grew up there. It's my hometown. So is my wife. I'll guarantee I can tell you some roads there. I'll know exactly where you're going because you can't do anything else but go there. When you go down that road that Spong went and the Jesus Seminar people went, you're going to wind up there. Amen. Idolatry of scholarship. Idolatry of science is a second one. When I was just a student at Ozark, I might have been in my first year there, I don't know. Somebody at the bookstore, Seth was running a bookstore there, I don't know if it was he or not, introduced me to a little book called Science is a Sacred Cow by a fellow named Anthony Standen. I still have that book. I still read it. Because he was right. It isn't so much that scientists are, but science is. And one of the problems with Spong and these fellows is they believe everything that science says. Even if it's changing while the book's being written that they're reading. Third thing I think the fellows do is they idolize man as a god. Doesn't Paul say something in Romans about men who professed themselves to be wise and they became fools and changed the glory of the immortal God into images like? Boy, did they ever do it. But there's some reasons why. It isn't... I'll just say this. <clears throat> the first 20 years or so of my life, I, I grew up on a farm, was born in a farmhouse five miles from nowhere. In those days, that a long time back, and it was nowhere. And the first 20 years or so of my life I spent on a farm. My wife is a farm girl and all that sort of thing, but let me say this. The stuff that these fellows base their conclusions on, I have thrown better stuff than that out the barn door with the pitchfork. Now I say that seriously. I mean, it isn't worth your time. But, here's the way it went. One of the things they do, scientifically speaking, when a fellow named Nicholas Copernicus changed things, and decided that the earth wasn't the center of the universe and all that kind of thing. That started in effect, or, uh, that was the first part of a little snowball that got big and science believed it and Galileo came along and confirmed it and the old Newton came along and did the same thing and that made in effect a mechanistic universe. God was not running it anymore. He, it, it was going. Didn't argue about who started it. It was just going, but God was not involved, as had been heretofore believed up to that particular point in time. But one of the things that did, in the minds of many, was that it took man out of the center of the universe. Made him just one of the things in the universe. Just one. Maybe good, but just one. When Charles Darwin came along in 1859, wrote his book, rather famous book, he started a revolution, too, called the Darwinian Revolution. What Darwin did was finish up what Copernicus started. And he said, in effect, if, if it has been true up to this point in time that man is higher than the angels, now he's just a bit above the animals. And, and the worm turned in this sense. 
And so man wasn't much better than the worm he'd been using for fish bait. Well, the end result of that, those two major revolutions, according to Spong and these fellows, is God is not involved in this universe if there is one. And secondly, we are surely not of anything of importance. It's like Bertrand Russell said, a rather famous fellow in, 19, in 18, yeah, 1935, he said, man, he said, is a product of a curious accident in a backwater. All of you know what backwater is. He's a curious accident in a backwater. And he wasn't the only one saying it. Along about that time, this fellow named Sigmund Freud, he'd, he, I don't know if he died by 35 or not, but he'd been saying the same thing. Uh, one of Freud's disciples was a guy named Benjamin Spock who changed the whole American family system. But they, 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 they agreed on these basic things, and both of them throughout their life made no effort, made every, I should say it this way, made every effort possible to say God is not involved in life and does not need to be. Of course, Freud thought that religion was a neurosis, which he said some of these days, man will be over. Now, philosophically speaking, a fellow named Rene Descartes, some of you know about him, but Descartes began to move away from the position that he had occupied and others before him, and the effect of God became a mathematical abstraction, and, uh, and, and some other fellows followed him along the line, a fellow named Kant, uh, so defined humanity that he was a split psychopathic, or not psychopathic, but uh, split personality in effect. And if a mathematical universe made little room for God, Kant said you can't believe in him because you don't know him. You can't find him out. And so then a fellow named David Hume came along and said, given enough time, a monkey with a typewriter could turn out Shakespeare's place. Well, all of that I know was false and you do too, but the effect of it was that the church retreated. That was the effect. I don't care what they say, it's what the church does that I'm interested in. And the church retreated. It stuck his head in and said, the guys are right, fellas, we got to recount here. Or recoup or whatever term you like. And they allowed theism to turn into deism, Thomas Jefferson Company, and then into atheism. And by the time of the 1880s, a fellow named Nietzsche could come along and say, what? God is dead. And he was. The kind of God that they believed in, in effect, the kind of God that had been taught, he was dead. Well, some fellows read him. Hitler did, for instance. But some more recent guys. In the 60s, a fellow named Harvey Cox wrote a book, The Secular City. I just kind of shake my head when I read that, but he wrote it anyway. And a fellow named Tom Alzheimer wrote the book, the, uh, the Death of God. Well, I know maybe you haven't written those, but many people uh, read them, but many people did read them. And many people believed him. The God, in effect, that Christianity had, had presented all those centuries had died. And part of that you can see in the effect on the younger generation in the 60s who believed Cox and who believed Altizer and who believed all of that. That's the effect. And you're seeing it now in the baby boom generation. Don't believe anything. Haven't taught their children anything because there isn't anything to be taught. Now, let me just say this along this line. I intend to take this watch off, so I... You need a good clock in here, but it's okay. <clears throat> Let me just say this. This past May, I was a participant in the Disciples Heritage Forum. And, and it, it is co-chaired by a, a fellow named uh, Victor Knowles, whom you, you may know and a guy named Richard Bowman out of the Disciples. And I see Dave's nodding his head here, so he may know, some of you know the rest of those fellows, but they co-chaired that. Well, I was a part of that forum. It's a two-day thing. Well, I, uh, truthfully, got my eyes opened. I knew that in 1968, well, Seth knows some of this because in 60 or 61, when he was down at Tulsa in Oklahoma City, uh, going with the Disciples then, that sort of thing down there, and he's nodding his head. But in, I knew in 1968 the disciples had decided to officially go with Koku, Church of Christ Uniting. I, I knew that they'd, but that didn't, didn't phase me. I wasn't in the disciples. <laughs> it wasn't going to affect me any of those arc, I didn't think. Well, uh, time goes by, and in 1994, so I understood down at, the, at this uh, uh, forum, the disciples in their national convention decided officially to join with 
I think it's eight other religious groups. And I, I wish I had, I, I was going to look up there and find out who all those are, but the one that you'll be interested in besides the disciples group is United Methodist group. Now those two you know about. The reason I'm talking along this line is because the disciples have gone down the same road that Spong and the Jesus Seminar people. They're right down the same road, reading the same road signs, driving the same speed, going same end. And Bowman and those fellows out of the disciples' movement can tell you that. I'll guarantee they'll tell you that. For instance, they will say, don't preach love because the disciples take it. If you can love, uh, that is, if you should love, whatever you love or whomever you love is just fine because you've loved. So what does that include? Whom can you love? Well, you can love everybody, but I'm talking about uh, with whom can you have a sexual relationship? With whom can you do anything? Anybody that you love. All things are possible if you love. And that's what the disciples are hearing. Now, I do not know what the United Methodist people are hearing. I just know about the disciples. But let me suggest it in a practical application. I'm sure the disciples' congregations around here. I know that. They're around where I live. They're United Methodist people around where I live. A little group there in town. Some of those people I've known since I've known anybody. Some are my relatives. Now, when this thing, when, you know, when the fat hits the fire in 2001, and that's my understanding of when it's supposed to officially be so, then we have a mutual interchange of preachers. The pastors, their word. I have a mutual interchange, so anyone out of all those nine groups can be assigned to any other group. Second thing, equally as important, any member of any given congregation can be and should be treated as equal to any other congregation. Now, brethren, I know that doesn't make much difference sometimes, but I know some good people in both the disciples and in the Methodist who will not abide that. That's an old term my granddad used to use. <laughs> will not, they are not going to stay. I also know, I was telling somebody here just a minute ago, that within the month now, there's a, a United Methodist group down east down here that, that decided unanimously. That's to the man, and the woman too for that matter. They decided unanimously to leave the United Methodist Church because they knew about this. They've been following it. And the group said, uh, the church said, hierarchy said, just fine, but you can't take the building. The building belongs to the group. It's just like the disciples thing used to be. You can leave if you want to, but the building is ours. Well, what I'm thinking is that people like you and me sitting here tonight, I think, if I may use this term, need to be sensitive to people who are going to be affected by that, who do not want to go that way. We need to be willing and able and ready to, if I may use this term, minister to them as we can. Because they're going to want to, there's some good people who want to know God, who want to love Him and serve Him. Maybe not quite up to where we would like to have them to be, but they want some place to worship. Let's be ready for them. That's application. Spong has, has greatly influenced millions of people. But maybe we can thwart some of that by being aware of where they are. I think of the text in Matthew 12 that it is said of the coming Messiah that he would not break a bruised reed. I think we need to be very, we need to read that text several times uh, in the next coming months and years. Let's, let's be careful with the reeds that are bruised. But some are sure going to be bruised. In a little different area, <clears throat> but about these fellows <clears throat> that I mentioned, in 1973, a fly got in the ointment, I guess you could say. 1973, along in uh, the late fall, I've kind of forgotten what the date was now, I didn't write it down so I don't remember it, it was the 500th birthday of a fellow named Nicholas Copernicus, amazing fellow, from Poland, Polish astronomer who started all this thing. And so the Polish government, country, had a great number of big names in science come to Poland to observe the 500th anniversary of Copernicus's birth. Among those fellows was a fellow named Steve Hawking. If you know anything about science, Steve is the premier, maybe, figure among scientific minds, astrophysicists especially, out of uh, Cambridge University in England. He's the premier figure, and a bunch of other guys bowed up even with him. One of the problems that went on in that, in that conference was this, a fellow named Brandon Carter. You don't know him, neither do I. 
But a fellow named Brandon Carter from England, actually from Cambridge University where Hawking is, and Carter is as well, gave a paper, a rather technical paper, entitled The Anthropic Principle. Now, I'm not trying to insult you or anything, but anthropic comes from Greek words, which means anthropos, that is man, you, me, any of us. Well, the effect of, 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 of Brandon Carter's paper was this. He said the anthropic principle refers to the universe of which we happen to be a part, and he said because it is true, and I'll explain it in a minute, because it is true, the universe cannot be accidental. There can be no such thing as an accident either with respect to Copernicus, who didn't say so, but the effect of that was, or with respect to Darwin. And he just shot holes, subtly but nicely, in both those ideas that are developed from both those men. For instance, the anthropic principle, Carter said, is this, all the seemingly arbitrary and unrelated constants in physics, I didn't study physics, maybe you didn't either, but if you did, have one thing in common, he said. These are precisely the values you need if you want to have a universe capable of producing life. That's accident? No. He said it is not accident. It was on purpose. He, reads, he goes ahead to say, what we can expect to observe in the universe must be restricted by the necessary conditions necessary for our presence as observer. State a little differently. If I can't see it, it isn't there. But from a different perspective, what I see is what God designed me to see. Can you relate Romans 1 to that point? Now, he didn't, but you can. What I see was up there because it was put there on purpose. Amen. On purpose. Now, some fellows named John Barrow and Frank Tipler, who are, who are well known in that area, wrote a book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. I know you may not want to go check that out of the library. I have a copy. You're welcome to read mine if you like. But they say this. In regard to Carter, he said, although we do not regard our position in the universe to be central or special in any way, this does not mean that our position cannot be special in some ways. See, Copernicus had said, he didn't say it, but they thought, man, it's nothing special at all. Just happened here, Darwin. These guys say, um, that's not so. You say, W.W., -W., why are you telling me all this? I want to tell you this, that there is a major shift going on in the scientific world. You're not going to read about it. It's like what we're talking about over here about all the believers in, in uh, Palestine. You're not going to read about it. But there's a major shift going on in the thinking of men in the scientific world right up to the highest level. You're not going to read about it, repeat myself here, but it's happening just the same. That's going to filter down in a lot of different ways. But I, I want to say this. Let me read, uh, go ahead a little bit more. Carter introduced, he said, these fellows said, Baron Tipper, this, the strong anthropic principle to provide reasons for observations. The universe, he said, must have those properties which allow life to develop within it at some stage in history. Didn't just happen. It's planned that way. Then they say, note the implications of this, and this is, this is Carter, quoting Carter. An implication of the strong anthropic principle is that the constants and laws of nature must be such that life can exist. This speculative statement, they say, leads to a number of quite distinct interpretations of a radical nature. First, the quite distinct interpret or, excuse, the first, the most obvious is to continue in the classical design argument. It was designed that way. Now you, you know as a teleological argument or design, you may know both things, but I, I want you to hear what these guys are saying. They're saying it didn't happen, folks. It was designed this way. It, it was meant to be this way. And they go ahead and say, that's A, uh, there's one, there exists, you say, from that one possible universe designed with the goal of generating and sustaining observers, that's you, and B, observers are necessary to bring the universe into being. Would you like me to repeat that one? Observers are necessary to bring the universe into being. Now, what does that say? You see, the guys are dealing with things you and I already believe. But these are fellows way up there, and it's going to filter down. It's going to filter down. Paul Davies and a fellow named John Gribben in their book, The Matter Myth, the first chapter of their book is The Death of Materialism. Now, some of you guys have been preaching about materialism. The rest of you have been hearing about it. They, the first chapter is materialism is dead. Now, you're not going to hear about it in the news, but it's dead just the same. Paul Davies wrote two books entitled God and the New Physics and the Mind of God. You wouldn't necessarily like 
the idea of God he presents, but I want you to see that here's a major figure in the scientific world who's dealing with the concept of God. And it hasn't been done for years and years and years and years. This quote, in the 1930s, Gilbert Ryle derided the dualism of Descartes in a pithy reference to the mind part as the ghost in the machine. That is, you're just a, you're just a physical thing and your mind is a ghost. That's what he said. Ryle articulated his criticism during the triumphal phase of materialism and mechanism. The machine he referred to was you, the human body, and your brain, themselves just a part of the larger cosmic machine. But already, in 1930, when he coined that phrase, the new physics was at work, undermining the worldview on which Ryle's philosophy was based. Today, on the brink of the 21st century, we can see that Ryle was right to dismiss the notion of the ghost in the machine, not because there's no ghost, but because there is no machine. That's important. Your kids have been hearing in school we're part of a machine. Can't get off, didn't want to be in, or in any way. These guys are saying there's no machine, folk. It was created that way. That's important. Now let me ask you, uh, let me suggest this for you. A fellow named Patrick Glenn, who teaches up at George Washington University, says, among the scientific people, he said, there are many believers. Fellows named Polkinghorne and Peacock and Russell, quote, are doing their best to inform the public of the realities of the post-secular world that the age-old scientific challenge to faith has simply collapsed, end quote. You may not care to think about that, but do you realize the implications of that? The scientific challenge to faith is gone from way up here. It'll take a while to get down. She's gone. They know they cannot hold it. So in psychology and psychiatry and biology and anthropology and several other ologies, all the thinking is changing. It's in transition. Let me give you an illustration. A fellow named Ian Scott Peck wrote a bestseller entitled The Road Less Traveled. It came out in, oh, like 1978 or somewhere. It's on the bestseller list for 10 years. Still a good book. Scott Peck was an unbeliever, but he recognized that it just didn't happen. And in his psychiatry practice, he's a psychiatrist, psychiatrist he recognized that you cannot have nothing. You can't have no God. You, you can't have any You have to have a creator and you have to live like it. You have to reason like it. You have to apply like it. And that's what he started doing in his practice. All of this says there's a big paradigm shift. I knew it was paradigm, but maybe you did too, but it's paradigm, okay? There's a big, there's a big change of thinking going on in the world in which you live. So I would suggest to you this. I know some of you didn't know about this. You didn't care who about it. But James or Jude says, make every effort he said, make every effort to keep the faith once and for all delivered saints. So don't give up out there. We have reason to believe. There are reasons to believe. We need to stay right with it. Things are changing. If Spong and his company are, if the things they say are true, we need to quit now. We need to dismiss. Look, my watch is over here at 15 after 8. We need to dismiss and go home. We're wasting our time. If, if what they say is true, how shall we preach? What shall we preach? To whom should we preach? How can I sing? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. Heaven can't. How can I sing that? I can't. Because it didn't happen. How can I sing? Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father. I don't have a Father. And He's not faithful. Except as I know Him personally in my own life. How can I sing? I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. I cannot sing that because he didn't love me and he didn't give his life for me. I cannot do that. How can I sing when peace like a river tendeth my soul and, and all that kind of thing? It is well. I cannot sing that because it is not true. There's no basis for it. What I want you to see that when you go down the road, those fellows went, Christianity, as you know it, is gone. It is G-O-N-E, gone. And the disciples are going down that road. And the Methodists are going down that road, some of them, and some of the others are going right along with them. I think of the, of the, of the uh, song, Sunrise. When I shall come to the end of my way, when I shall rest at the close of life's day, when welcome home, I shall hear Jesus say, oh, that will be glory for me. I mean, not that I'm so glorious, but hey, that's going to be a great day. But that's false. Jesus did not come. He did not go. He's not coming back, according to these fellows. And if they're right, I think we'd ought to say about Jesus like the men in Acts 22 said about Saul, away with him. 
You understand that? If Jesus is what these men say, away with him. He's no good to me. and not any good to you either. I'm reminded of a rather famous fellow who said, here I stand, God helping me. I can't do any other. I don't know how he said it, but I'm sympathetic with his position. Like the writer of Hebrews said, I do not intend to be among those, he said, who shrink back and are destroyed. He said, I am among those who believe and I'm saved. That's 1039. I choose to be among those, and somebody quoted maybe Aaron this morning, uh, who hope in the Lord, who renew their strength and fly and walk and never get tired. I intend to be in that company. Because I think there's some reason to be in that company. When Fanny Crosby wrote many songs, one of them that comes to mind right here is this one. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story, most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. You see, if Spong and his company are true, there can be no Christmas songs. I can't sing Old Little Town of Bethlehem. I can't sing uh, Away in a Manger. I can't sing Hark the Herald Angel because they didn't do that. There isn't any of that true. I am not persuaded. Seth knows, and some of the rest of you know, none of these positions are new, folk. We studied them all. In Critical Introduction to Life of Christ at school, we studied them all. There isn't anything new here. What is new is that these people are getting an audience like they've never had before. And they're affecting people like they never did before. I know they've always affected people, I understand that. But TV and the internet goes every direction. Let's just, let's just be ready. How about the last little point here, the people? For whom is Jesus coming? Well, of course, those who are going to be glad that he's coming. I don't think the others are going to be much interested, but I intend to be in that first group. So Peter asked this little question, been quoted before, what manner of persons ought we to be? We'll make it first person plural here. What manner of persons ought Wallace to be? I'll do it singular. What manner of person ought Wallace to be? And you can put your name in there if you want to. To the Thessalonian people, Paul would write in chapter 3 and verse 11 of his second book, we hear, he said, that there's some among you that are idle. Well, he remarked to them in the earlier verses, he said, when we were in you, with you, he said, we were not idle. Now, I, I know the context, generally speaking, is, is thinking about, about living and, and doing the kinds of things, but part of it was, if Jesus is coming, we ought not to be idle. In any sense of the term, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, talking about business, or, or, or any of those things, I'm talking about the fact that, that we need to be at work for Jesus. Uh, I'm not saving ourselves at work, but we just need to be busy for Jesus. I saw a bumper sticker here a while back said, Jesus is coming. Look busy! Well, we ought to do that. We ought to look busy. I think of the songs, we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. One of the reasons we need to encourage one another to do that, I think, is this. That if we don't, if we don't believe Jesus and we don't react to it as we ought to, we're going to be a whole lot like the people that we hear about every once in a while, beginning, say, in 1844 and on down to the present day with all the thousands in Korea. We're going to quit and sell our houses and homes and go meet somewhere and then be ashamed and embarrassed because it didn't happen the way we thought it was going to. I think one of the reasons that the scripture keeps talking about now is to keep us from doing that. So that we don't, if we don't know, for instance, let me look, look at it this way. If Jesus did not know the time of his coming, which he said, I assume he's right, then the only thing he could say to people like you and me is, I'm going to come now. What else could he say? If he did not know the time, only his father knew it, how does he know when God's going to send him? He doesn't. So what is he, advice is he going to give you? Wait until after I come and then get ready? No. He thinks too much of us for that. Amen. He needs, I mean, we need to believe him. You just be ready now. Amen. When we think about Jesus coming, let's paraphrase the text in Luke 18, 8. Will he find Wallace faithful when he comes? Yeah, you need to get it down personal. Instead of just saying, will he find you? Use whoever. How about, how about 
Wallace. Will he find Wallace faithful when he comes? Will he find me unbelieving? What will he find me doing? In Luke 19, beginning at verse 11 through verse 27, the text tells us that Jesus went on to tell a parable to the people because he was near to Jerusalem, and two, people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. He, he talked about a noble man who went away to a far country to be crowned king and then to return. And before he left, he gave his servants 10, it's the old pound thing, so what I learned pound thing in King James is minus in some of the modern versions, gave his servants 10, in effect, 10 areas of stewardship and expected them to do something with it. Well, interestingly enough, the man came back. Some of his subjects, you may remember the text, did not said, we don't want that man to be our king, and they, they decided that. But he came back just like he said he would. And he called everybody into account just like he said he would. And he gave each one of those men what they deserved. And the one fellow, you remember, who just had one, he said, well, I knew you were a hard man, like Matthew 25. I knew you were a hard man. And the man said to him, yes, and that's the way you're going to be judged, just that way. And for his minor, he told his servants, take it and give it to the one who has ten. And they, they responded. But he said, I tell you, verse 26, everyone who has, to everyone who has, more will be given. But to the one who has nothing, even that which he has will be taken away. You're going to lose it all. It's all or nothing thing when Jesus comes, it looks to me like. <clears throat> now, this little question. Will we be... Will we be more ready for Jesus? I, I recognize there's a truth to the fact, as Aaron's saying this morning, that the church is going to be ready. I understand that point. But there's also a thought that all the text that we quote was addressed to people like you and me. <clears throat> Watch. I'm coming. I'm like a thief. All addressed to folk like us. The question I have in my mind is this. Will we be more ready for Jesus to come again than Israel was for his first coming? Isn't there a text in John 1.11 that says something like this? He came to his own and they weren't ready. And the majority of people did not accept him. I think that's kind of a sobering thing. That they'd had all those years to prepare. 2,000 from Abraham. We've had 2,000. Are we any more ready than they? There were some. But that wasn't the most. It wasn't even the majority. Expected and hopeful. That's what I think we'd ought to be. And that's been repeated, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. But I, I want you to think that if I am like most of the Israelites in Jesus' day, I will not be ready when he comes. I will have a form of godliness. Right? I will do that. I think about... <laughs> I think about the end in lots of ways. I'm not, as I said, as young as I once was, but I think about my father. He's now dead. And if you went out to the cemetery there in Granola, out to Green Lawn, it, it, my father's tombstone out there, and it would say, Donald W. Wardick, 1905-1980. The dash is what I'm talking about. If we were to talk about your dash, what's between those dates of birth and death, what would we say? Are we already at mid-dash, as it were? Are we two-thirds of the way to dash? Is, it re is the tombstone ready to be written? We just don't know it yet. What would be the summary of our life? Wallace Wardick, 1932-dash, whatever the last year is. What does that dash stand for? When they preach my funeral sermon, what will they say? He started fast, but he didn't last? Or something along those lines? What does that dash mean? in your life. Boy, it means heaven or hell, I'll tell you what it means. Amen. Our text, you kept my command to endure patiently, wrote to the church at Philadelphia. Hold on to what you have, so that no one take your crown. It's been repeated. Chapter 22, verse 7, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. 1910 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I assume that. That means that Jesus said it, I believe it, what? And that settles it. And so the end little thing, even so come, 
Lord Jesus has been repeated there. But I want you to think, God made promises. He's faithful, who promised, the text says. Uh, he promised a person, and he was faithful, and I think he will be again. Now, the question mark then is not about God, points one and two, but it's about point three. Who are the people? Well, of course, us. But who are we? Many years ago, in 1934, and it's page 240 in your book, that green book, and if you want to open up there, I want you to read a song, not sing, but I just want you to read a song with me. Uh, maybe you may not even know it. I don't know whether you do or not. In fact, I had a mind, I'll tell you this, but I didn't get it done. I was going to ask Given's daughter, who sang last night or yesterday, to sing this song. I think she'd do well with this one. But I want you to turn to 240 in the green book and read right along with me here. Are you there yet? 240. Let's read all three stanzas. Let's go. When he shall come, resplendent in his glory, to take his own from out this veil of night. Oh, may